Hi guys, in this video, we are going to talk about the difference between exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor analysis. So up until now, we talked about factor analysis, but we really only talked about exploratory factor analysis. So EFA is a way to reduce dimensionality of the data, or rather find a simple latent variable model that explains the complex data. I'm going to do a short review for newcomers. This is the EFA model. We assume that the variables are actually a linear function of some latent factors called common factors, plus some uniqueness, which can be further broken down into specific factors and noise. The coefficients that relate the factors to the variables are called loadings. This is the graph of how it looks like. We have in circles the factors, and they actually manifest different observed variables depicted here in squares. In EFA, all factors affect all variables, though we are trying to find some representation which groups the factors with the variables that they affect the most. The orthogonal model assumes that the factors are orthogonal to each other, that is that there is no correlation between them, and that they are orthogonal to the uniqueness, the epsilons. Given these assumptions, we can derive the implied covariance matrix as a function of our unknown parameters, the L matrix of coefficients, and the psi matrix of specific factors variances. We saw that there are a few ways to estimate the parameters of the model. We estimate from data. Since in factor analysis, we only analyze the covariance matrix, essentially comparing the implied covariance to the observed one, the only data we care about is the sample covariance matrix. We talked a bit about PCA and maximum likelihood and mentioned other methods such as principal factor, mean rest, etc. There are also ways to estimate the factor scores per observation. We saw two of them, weighted least squares and conditional normal distribution. We also talked a bit about rotations. There are orthogonal rotations, which are justified by the fact that the solutions are not identifiable. We can rotate them to find better representations. And there are also oblique rotations for which the implied model is non-orthogonal. There is a covariance matrix for the factors, which is not diagonal. The implied covariance now looks like this. So how does confirmatory factor analysis differs from exploratory factor analysis? Well, the difference between exploratory and confirmatory analysis in statistics is actually a general topic. Usually, if we look at the data and then derive a model, a rule, or an hypothesis, this is called exploratory analysis. Once we formulated some model or a rule, we then have to confirm or test the hypothesis and this requires new data. So likewise, in factor analysis, if we already have some latent variable model in our mind and we want to test its validity, we will perform confirmatory factor analysis. So does this mean that CFA is the same as EFA only on new data? Well, not exactly. In EFA, we have some limitations. First, the number of factors is usually not decided beforehand. Then L, the factor loadings matrix, is a full matrix, we don't restrict it. Psi, the error covariances, is a diagonal matrix. There are no correlation between specific factors. And finally, phi, the factor's covariance, is the identity matrix, unless using oblique rotations. But in CFA, the researcher already has some model in mind. And so the number of factors could be decided beforehand. L will probably have restrictions. Some factors will affect some variables while they won't affect others. Also, factor coefficients, for example, can be shared across different variables, making them equal. And psi and phi can also have correlations. This is how the graph will look like now. Notice that now each of the factors affect their own set of variables. They don't affect the same variables. Also notice that there can be correlations between factors and between the epsilons. These are represented by a two-headed curved arrow. We can also force the loadings to be equal in the loading matrix. Basically, we added restrictions to the EFA model that corresponds to our theoretical model. There are some important issues to take note of in confirmatory factor analysis. One issue regards identifiability. We want our analysis to give us one solution, not many different ones. Since we are only working with the sample covariance, one fairly obvious necessary condition is that the number of free parameters in the model needs to be less than or equal to the number of values in the covariance matrix. And I should note unique values since the covariance matrix is symmetric. 
There are also other rules. I refer you to chapter seven of the book Structural Equations with Latent Variables by Bolin. Another issue which is related is the issue of scale. Latent factors don't have inherent scale. For every solution, we can scale the factors and scale the related loadings by the inverse. This is also a form of non-identifiability. And to overcome this, researchers use one of two approaches. Either setting the factor loadings to the first observed variable to one for each of the factors, or constraining the fees, the variances of the factor loadings to be one. Usually the factor loading coefficients are also standardized by multiplying them with the respective ratio between the standard deviation of the observed variable and the factor. This makes them unitless, but could also be misleading. Bolin mentioned that one of the false beliefs about CFA is that it only deals with standardized coefficients, but it's not really the case. So using standardized coefficients is more of a personal taste than a necessity. For estimations, notice that now we cannot use the principal component analysis since we are restricting the coefficients. We can still perform maximum likelihood by assuming the normal distribution and use some numerical optimization such as gradient descent, Newton Raphson, etc. We can also do least squares, which is actually similar to mean rest in EFA. In least squares, what we want is to minimize the squared residuals between the sample covariance and the implied covariance. There's also a weighted variation. These type of estimation techniques are also known as asymptotically distribution-free estimations. Now, in this video, I will only mention briefly the topic of model validity. To test the model validity, we can also get variance for the estimators, for example, asymptotic wild estimators, and from them, get the p-values for the coefficients. There are also general goodness of fit tests that tell us how well our model explains the data. And these include the overconservative chi-square. Uh, there are also CFI, TLI, and other measures. Again, I won't go into them in this video. And there are also measures to compare different models and see which model explains the data better. One way of doing so is comparing the log likelihood or conducting a likelihood ratio test, ANOVA, AIC, BIC, etc. Well, that's all for this video. I hope it gave you some clear view of what is CFA and how it differs from EFA. See you in the next video.